Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Mario Novelli. I'm the director of the Centre for International Education at the University of Sussex and co-PI of the Peer Network. Um, welcome everyone to week four of the Peer Network lecture series, The Political Economy of Education in Times of Conflict, Crisis and Pandemic. Um, the Peer Network is a GCRF AHRC funded network between the Centre for International Education, University of Sussex, University of Cape Town, Nazarbayev University, Kazakhstan and the University of Ulster. Uh, and aims to promote engagement with critical political economy analysis of education in contexts of conflict and crisis. The lecture series is also supported by UGFIET, the UK Forum on International Education and Training. All lectures are live streamed through YouTube and available afterwards and will become part of a free open source uh, resource for all those interested in learning and sharing knowledge uh, and practice about the political education, political economy of education. Please sign up to our CIE uh, YouTube page uh, to view those. Um, today's session is uh, led by Professor Yusuf Said, uh, Center for International Education. And the title is Evidence and Education, Policy Making in the Global South During COVID-19, Pundits, Social Movements and Policymakers in an Age of Unpredictability. The most elaborate title so far in our uh, series. Um, before I introduce him, I want to briefly run through a few housekeeping rules and logistics. Um, firstly, please mute yourself unless you're asking a question in the Q&A. Uh, please ask any questions during the talk through the chat function uh, and I will collate them and come back to, later, to you later to request um, for you to ask the question or uh, so, as sometimes happens, people ask me to ask the question for them, which is fine. Um, each speaker will talk for around uh, 35 to 40 minutes. So Yusuf will talk for 35 to 40 minutes. Then we'll have a breakout. Uh, um, what we call here a Sussex buzz, a few minutes so you can talk to each other in small groups and reflect on the lecture. Um, and then we can come back to the plenary for a nice uh, question and answer session. And we'll try to finish uh, promptly around quarter past two UK time. So let me just say a few words about uh, uh, Yusuf Syed. Um, Yusuf is a professor of international education and development policy in the Center for International Education here at the University of Sussex and will be taking over as the center's director from January 2021. He's had a long and illustrious career internationally recognized for his work on teachers and teacher education, global education policy and education policy in South Africa. Like many researchers in our field, he has moved from the policy world to academic uh, to the academic world and back again throughout his career, with stints at both UNESCO, the Global Monitoring Report, and D DFID, the Department for International Development. Uh, he has also been influential in advising the UNESCO Teacher Task Force and supporting Education International, the Global Teacher Trade Union Federation. In 2018, uh, Yusuf won the prestigious South African Education Research Association, SAIRA, Research Honours Award for his uh, lifelong contribution to research on South Africa. Uh, thank you very much, Yusuf, for taking time today to present your thinking on the COVID-19 education relationship. And the, zo the Zoom is yours. I will stop sharing and pass the screen to you. Uh, let me unmute myself. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Mario, and very generous introduction. Clearly, I'm going to get Mario to, in future to introduce myself all the time, as well as be my neighbor in the office across the room. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk for about hopefully less than that. But what I want to talk about is what I, what I have been interested in and working on is the idea principally around policy making in general, but policy making during the times of COVID-19. So that is primarily the driver of this talk and the papers we did, and I'll come to that just now. And the questions that we've 
are, are attempted to address in this talk and in the research we've been doing around COVID-19 is who gets to make choices in education during the times of COVID-19 pandemics crises in who, get, who are the participants in the policy making process? What is the role of teachers? What is the role of academics? What are the role of social movements? Those are some of the questions that we're trying to answer. In addition, what we're trying to do in this presentation is look at the kind of choices that are made during the times of the pandemic, but generally crisis, uh, crisis in general. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about four parts. I'm going to talk about pandemics and crises as interlocking. I'm going to talk about how policy is made during times of crisis, review some of the policy choices, and then look at crises as a moment of opportunity and a chance to rethink the policy imaginary for education. Now, the talk is based on several papers we have done and are concluding. Uh, Masina Singh, myself, and a few colleagues at the Center for International Teacher Education have been working around the issue of uh, COVID-19 and education at several levels. We've written a paper for the Southern African Review of Education, which I'm drawing on now. We've got a paper coming out in the Journal of Health and Social Policy around policy making. And we've also been working with Education International and Open Society Foundation around COVID crises and teacher professional development and curriculum in Africa based on eight countries, South Africa being one of them. In this talk, I'll primarily select data and information from all the pieces of work we're doing, but principally look at South Africa. Let me start by making a fairly obvious choice, uh, comment about the pandemic. In a sense, it's not like we haven't had crises before. Crises have always been around. They've either been natural dis disasters, as in the tsunami, or we've had crises around political instability or co uh, context of crisis. What has marked out COVID-19 in particular as a crisis is that it's generalized the experience of a few to everybody in a sense, even though everybody has not been affected equally, the fact that it's affected everybody, either in the form of lockdowns in countries or school closures, have, uh, have, have caused the, the imagination of policymakers and public. But it's not like refugees haven't been locked out of education before. It's not like children in conflict have not had have been denied education for a long time. It's not like the children haven't been hungry or the poor impoverished have been locked out before. So in a sense, the pandemic is not different from other crises. The one difference being is generalized the experience of a very, of a few to the many. And that's why it's caught so much of public attention, which is the first point we're making that use, uh, I'll skip the slide. The first point we're making is that the pandemic is a set of interlocking crises at the heart of which in the paper we argue is inequality and what we call the excessive effects of agrarious forms of capitalism or crisis capitalism as people spoke about. And this crisis as an interlocking crisis, we in our paper talk about four dimensions of it, as a health crisis, as an environmental crisis, as the impacting conflict uh, context, and crisis of global public goods, for example, water. In a sense, the pandemic intensifies and, ex and exacerbates existing forms of, of inequalities, uh, as well as exacerbates and intensifies existing crises. For example, in Somalia, the crisis of COVID comes at the same time as environmental degradation, as well as conflict. And in this sense, what the important thing about these crises are, uh, and here we quote the Gates Foundation's latest report, all these catastrophes, and in the paper we talk about it, are fundamentally undermining the progress made, particularly around SDGs in general and inequality. And in particular, the, the 
pandemic hurts people of color the most, the marginalized and the oppressed the most. They are getting, sorry, let me just move the slide screen out. They are getting sick and di dying from COVID and suffering its economic consequence at a much higher rate than white people. According to the US Census Bureau, 23% of white Americans said that they were not con confident they would, could make rent in August, a frightening enough statistics. But by contrast, Black and Latin American, the number was almost double that. So clearly while the crisis has impacted all, it's disproportionately impacted more adversely those who are marginalized, those in those, sorry, uh, of color. Uh, sorry, let me just uh, get to the next slide. So sorry about that. Um, further on the report, goes to talk about the economic consequence of the crisis, how much money governments are able to spend on the safety net and people are suffering. The Institute for Health Matrix and Evaluation estimates that extreme poverty has gone up by 7% in just a few months because of COVID-19, ending a 20 year streak of progress. Already in 2020, the pandemic has pushed almost 37 million people below the US one to two dollar a day extreme poverty line. Now, while we talk about the poverty line, the reality is that it's set low. And what it really means in real terms is harder for most people. So in a sense, we argue in our paper that the current crisis and pandemic is as much a crisis of the environment as it's of health. Michelle uh, in 2020 astutely notes that COVID-19 is a stark reminder that our assault on the natural world has consequence. Humans may not have created the coronavirus, but we have cultivated the unnatural conditions needed for nature to toss a $10 trillion time bomb into our economy. In other words, what the argument is that the pandemic is both a cause and effect of existing frailties and inequalities in the global order, as well as existing conditions in the global world and in the and within nation states, which is why we talk about in our paper interlock the idea of the pandemic as part of an interlocking crisis, global in cause and effects, but disproportionately uh, impacting the poor, the marginalized and the disadvantaged greatest. Now, what has been really interesting in this and in our work, we talk about how public policy arises in this context and how evidence and advice from a wide range of stakeholders are consist, considered. Yet in the research we've done is that it's been a very narrow group of people who've made educational policies and generally uh, policies around COVID in, in particular. And in the paper, and I can come back to it in question time, we talk about how the hard sciences and the natural sciences have dominated policy making during the, uh, during the time of COVID-19, and in particular, marginalized social sciences and the critical social sciences in particular. Where social sciences have been brought into the picture, it's been largely behavioral scientists who've been brought in to look at how people would respond to particular interventions or actions of government choices. For example, how do people respond to lockdown? How would learners respond to lockdown. Now in South Africa, when we looked at that, what was interesting is South Africa set up a committee called the Ministerial Advisory Committee, similar to SAGE in the UK. And in the initial review of this committee, of the more than 50 representatives on that committee, largely the majority were from the medical prof profession and largely policy makers. But what was significant about the way South Africa dealt with the pandemic and the Ministerial Advisory Committee was not very dissimilar to many other countries which invoked disaster management regulations to make policy. In a sense, democratic process got silent to an extent by invoking the, uh, the regulations around managing these as emergency and disaster context. This approach by the South African government mirrored the global trend to source advice from local command councils 
and rely largely on certain kinds of advice. And in fact, the trade union movement who we interviewed in South Africa said that we played a very limited role at the start because the government used the Disaster Management Act to close areas of consultation. We had to force to be consulted. The government was not do doing that and we had to force the government to ensure that on any education policy we were consulted. Clearly part of the issue around COVID has been the ways and we need more research on that, how social movements have been activated or should be activated to ensure that the policymaking choices are more democratized. Science, as I said before, has been involved, right? Yet science is often contradictory and it often has multiple perspectives and outcomes, right? One such contradiction if for those who've been following the debate uh, around COVID is the lack of evidentiary consensus and arguably great misuse of science in the debate surrounding the misuse of hydrochloroquine as a vaccine, right? And in that sense, there's an assumption within government and in South Africa in particular, that while we call upon the science fraternity to advise policymaking during times of crises, as has happening in the current pandemic, scientists do not have all the solution. As with social science, the orientation of their research varies, often leading to different and sometimes contradictory views. The idea that science in and of itself, as I'll show later on education, can resolve many of the questions around policy is misplaced. And we argue that decision making, uh, decision making based solely on science cannot be the basis of informed decision making, especially if the science on which the evidence on which is based is contested, partial, incomplete, and often framed ideologically and politically by the very research community that generates it. And one of the interesting things is the role of pundits and advisors in this. And here there's been very interesting examples. One of the particular one in South Africa, when one of the members of the Ministerial Advisory Committee, Professor Gray, who also chair of the South African Medical Council, publicly rebuked the government for its stance on lockdown. In other words, while she was appointed on the panel of providing uh, evidence to advise government, she used this knowledge to argue that the policy choices government was making was wrong. I'm not gonna go into the merits or demerits of whether she was right or wrong, but what, uh, what we talk about in our research is that her intervention conflates the roles and runs a risk of misunderstanding the different knowledge bases and rationalities of researchers and policy experts on the one hand and government policymakers on the other hand. We talk in our paper about massive policy overreach. And we talk about the policy overreach of experts and pundits who somehow believe that what they say therefore must be what should be the claim to the truth. And in particular, we quote Mass uh, 2020, who contends that in times such as the current pandemic, but generally in crisis, we are faced with competing imperatives. And we need to balance of interest, uh, the diverse interests of society between education and economy, between freedom and choice on the one hand, and between public policy ones. And Matz goes on to argue that philosophers of justice argue that how to allocate benefits and burdens in ways that are fair. Such issues abound in the context of COVID-19. Consider here debates concerning how to balance the interests of the elderly against those of the young. If most of those who die from COVID are older than 19, while Africa has a relatively large population of young people, how do you make a trade-off between them in Africa? And in particular, we argue that this uh, knee-jerk reaction to justifying policy choices on hard science inadequately and mistakenly ignores contextual issues and the social challenges, which ends up, as I'll show later, increased social inequities. Uh, um, sorry, let me just, oh, sorry, I need to, I went a bit too far back. 
Um, and here's an example of what we talk about policy linearity and mistakes. You know, there was a big debate like everywhere and right now in UK and South Africa where the school should open or not close. And there were two groups of people who were arguing for school reopening. There were a group of academic uh, on the one hand, Van der Berg and Spall, but we found most fascinating the South African Pediatric Association. We did a discourse analysis of their advice to government on school opening. This is a direct quote from their long memo to government. They said the relatively scant and weak quality of available evidence, particularly from resource poor settings about the effects of school opening but they still ended up advocating for schools to reopen in South Africa. Thus, not considering the unequal landscapes of schooling in South Africa, including the fact that many schools do not have clean running water or proper hygienic infrastructure to help mitigate the spread of violence. So SAPA as an association, we found really interesting at the level of policy in overreach and how they dealt with it. Now, what happened between in South Africa and school closures and school openings? Schools were closed in around March 2020. And in South Africa, it worsened inequalities for working mothers. It also directly impacted learners in ECD centers, which had to be closed. And in fact, this has been one of the blind spots of the debates around COVID-19 and education. While understandably, there's been a focus on schooling, less has been said about the closures of ECD facilities and early childhood cares. School feeding schemes cease operation. Gender-based violence increased. The number of reported cases in child, that Childland said between March 2019 and 2020 20 increased by 67% uh, and grew more so during the time of the pandemic. Um, in fact, by mid-April, about 1.8 billion students in the world but were affected by school closures impacting around 99 percent of the world's student population that's been one of the fascinating things around COVID. is it has almost resulted for a period of time the total closure of schooling as we know it um, schools started reopening in south africa in june 2020 and we interviewed several people uh, about including unions so what South Africa did was they, like many other countries, they had a staggered return to schooling with the idea that a number of schools uh, learners attend every two or three days, firstly. Secondly, only certain grades, particularly those that were at the terminal phases of schooling, either at the end of basic or at the end of secondary. Now, here's what the union stole us. So we ended up adopting a system that says we must have 50% of the school back at a time so that we split every class by 50%. In theory, that tends to social distancing, but in reality, that doesn't because many of our schools, including in wealthier province, still have classes in some of our areas exceeding 60. So even if we, when you split the class in half and you have a class of 30, you still have too many pupils for social distancing. Clearly at the poorer end of the schooling sector, the idea of school reopening with socially distanced measures is not viable in many cases. What's been fascinating has been how curriculum assessment been dealt with during the pandemic. Here's a review we did about global approaches. Generally, there's been such a strong push to at one level to maintain exams, reschedule it, and where there's been an attempt to rethink orthodoxies around examinations, they've been positive but limited. Here's a, a re report that came out today from the Center for American Progress for the US. They argue for no waivers of the federally mandated administration of standardized testing in spring 2021. And the UK government uh, in England and Wales this morning said in England and Wales, they want to hold on to the idea of an externally ad administered GCSE. Glass in Berlin uh, puts it very aptly. The idea of holding on to golden standards of externally examine, uh, examinations to assess progression and validation of learning is ill-timed, tone deaf and disruptive. Clearly, there's no way in one which can think about 
examinations in the way they currently schedule whether in any of the regions of the world can occur in ways they are doing. In South Africa, there's been an attempt to cancel grade 12 learner exams, although that hasn't really occurred fully. Yet what was interesting in South Africa, schools were allowed to trim the curriculum, right? But there's been an overwhelming discourse in curriculum assessment globally and in South Africa with the idea of learning days lost, as if content learning is the only thing that happens in schools. In other words, the Typical education response has been, let's, just folk, let's worry about the loss of learning. And the, I, the word loss of learning and content loss has dominated the way in which policy choices are made. This is what a union officials say, and I'm relying heavily in this talk on unions. We do have government officials later on. I'll talk to and in the bigger, uh, larger papers that we wrote. The government started saying, look, it can almost cut the number of subjects then we, the unions had to come in and say, no, no, but that means another debate because what about the career of this particular learner? So that is not curriculum trimming. It is something else because if you changing the policy altogether, please read carefully because it has unintended consequences for our economy and for us. Now, here's the interesting debate in South Africa. The unions bought into the argument to an extent about content learning. However, they did point out something very important in this quote, and we talk about it, that the idea of loss of learning and the idea of catch up learning has disproportionately impacted the impoverished more than middle class with the required cultural capital. And in the paper, we talk about that the middle class have benefited from school closures and home learning more than the poor. Teachers support and professional development. In the research we've did in South Africa and globally, very little su support is provided to teachers and learners in terms of effective support system. Online resources are made available to teachers and as I'll show in the next slide, they're really not effective. Here's what uh, the quote says from a government official. Well, this is where the biggest problem lies in terms of psychosocial support. It's all about resourcing at the end of the day. For example, in the free state, when we questioned about the psychosocial support, the free state said, yes, we are ready. This is one of the large provinces in South Africa. But yet we only have one psych school psychologist in the province and two social workers. That is in the province, in our department, we have 3,000 schools with three people who are, if you like, with the required psychosocial support, either in form of school psychologists on social or social workers to service the entire school population. Then they agree that we'll get people from other cross-sectoral departments like social development. The reality, as the officials say, this never happened. Clearly what's occurring is that the extent and coverage and reach of psychosocial support is limited. Now, online education, everybody's talk, talking about. In the paper, we talk about it as a private solution that found the public problem to attach to. Radio and television, online learning, mobile technologies have increased. A lot of this is proprietal in nature. A lot of the platforms, as uh, like Microsoft Teams, Skype, Zoom, like this one. In fact, the income, if you look at the latest income earnings of Zoom, you'll notice that their stock prices have, their shares and their dividends have gone through the roof. Clearly what this has done is big tech companies have seen a very huge advantage in particular from the COVID-19. And I think one of the difficulties that we'll face is how do we cope and manage and mitigate the growing privatization of educational approaches through ed tech and the rise of big ed tech, both in terms of the hardware, such as computers, or software, such as Zoom, Teams, Skype, or in terms of the content that it gets put on in broadcast in radio or TV. This is the, some of the quotes. Government officials say is we've made resources available in the middle. 
but ridiculous things occur. For example, in public television, you have lessons for your grade fives at midnight because that's when you get free time on television. Clearly, that's not the time you expect your learners or teachers are to be up to be learning. Similarly, while there's been a lot of talk about online learning and classes that are available through online learning, the absence of internet connection or the cost of data and infrastructure of technology, which is in the hands of private sector company, has been exorbitantly expensive, making it difficult for the poor and teachers themselves to have that. And in particular, notwithstanding government's attempts to work with large data providers to reduce the cost of data to learners. In a sense, it then leads us to argue that the big tech and the online solution reflects and exacerbates the inequality. And this is a quote from the union official. The impact has been disproportionate between the wealthier schools and the poor schools, and there has been very little done to address it. And clearly, while there have been many commentators who have talked about the 21st, the industrial, the 21st century skills, the fourth industrial revolution, we argue that what we see globally and in South Africa, this pandemic is leaving the poor, the marginalized even further behind than before. Now, in the last five minutes, I'll try to wrap this up and see where we go. We say that part of the problem of the COVID pandemic and the work we did is that teachers matter and they've been neglected both at the level of policy and in terms of thinking. There's been very little professional development to support teachers to work in these new modalities. Policies that have been developed ignore contextual realities. There's been a blurring between, on the one hand, between policy makers, sorry, I'll go back. Sorry, I'm not sure how to use it. There's been a blurring between policy makers and policy advisors, not, uh, not always positively. And in fact, there's been so much talk about new normal and we need to return to a new normal. We thought it'd be nice to capture a quote from a teacher you know, who said, we don't need a better new normal, we want a better normal. And we need to say we need to learn from these and other crises so that when we bow back, we bow back better rather than bow back to what we have before, including at the level of assessment. In other words, the COVID-19 and crisis should allow us to rethink our education dogmas and orthodoxies, rethink our education delivery mo modalities. Don't forget issues of financial oversight and accountability and make sure that we address and attend to the creeping privatization of education that the crisis has set in train. In other words, we shouldn't see this as a crisis of no choice. There is a choice. There are alternatives. And the alternatives is a policy imaginary to create a better world and a better new normal. So we end off our arguments in our papers and our research to say the crisis is in a moment to imagine a better, more just, more humane world in which we pay attention to people and the planet to secure the means and conditions for equitable, inclusive prosperity in a peaceful world. Because otherwise, all that's gonna happen is the crisis becomes one more uh, condition of inequality and it continues to exist in and amongst other crises, intensifying and, ex and exacerbating and mutually reinforcing existing crises and inequality. Um, I'll stop here, Mario, and hand it back to you. Okay, uh, thanks, Yusuf. Um, what I'm gonna do now um, is give you some chance uh, to talk uh, in smaller groups. So I'm gonna set up um, some breakout rooms uh, so that people can reflect on some of the different dimensions of the talk and come back uh, with questions uh, in about uh, eight minutes. So I'm just going to set up the breakout rooms. Um, if for some reason people uh, don't go into uh, a breakout room I'll, and you're left alone, I'll move you. I'll keep an eye on the rooms to make sure that they've got enough people in. Uh, okay. Okay. 
uh, you should get invited now.
Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully, uh, you had a chance to uh, discuss uh, some of the issues that came up. Um, I'm going to open. I'm going to open up the discussion now. Uh, if you want to uh, ask a question, um, if you just put a cross inside the chat. Um, as I can't see everybody's face uh, in the uh, gallery view, um, so I might miss people. So if you just put a, a cross in, if you want to make a point or raise a question or uh, an issue. Uh, OK, the floor is yours, participants. Who's going to kick off? Who's going to start? OK, I have Genevieve. Uh, over to you. Uh, you're on mute. We had um, this is just picking up a point that we discussed in our group. Um, and it was uh, a point that was made around the using the fact that governments have been using these emergency mechanisms to kind of fast track um, policies or decisions. And I guess a question that came up for us is, at what point um, do governments say in, in South Africa or, or the UK or, or elsewhere, you know, who, who decides when is that transition phase that, to say, we're not in that emergency phase anymore? And when do, when do they, you know, is, is it not okay for, for, that, for that sort of fast track um, emergency mechanisms to, to be used and that more um, consultative decision making processes uh, need sort of need to come back in, given that it's it's just looking like a, a longer term uh, issue. So that's one of our sort of questions that came up for us. Uh, thank you very much, um, Yusuf. Before you respond, can I um, let uh, Roy de Silva uh, coming in from Portugal to uh, ask his question? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, uh, I have one question. You, uh, in, in a moment, you, you talk about the private actors and, and the rise of uh, EduTech. And I don't know if you you guys explored who's paying the, this, when, especially in, in education systems where the private sector has a, a huge penetration. For instance, I, I'm witnessing in the case of Angola, for instance, because there's a lot of low fee private schools, these schools are pressing the government to transfer funds to them because of the pandemic that they became almost out of business. So they are pressuring the government to get public funds to keep operating. I don't know if you guys explore this issue. So the main question is who's paying the, the, the tech, who's going to schools and also the, the, for the schools keep operating because especially in, in countries where the, the private sector is has a big presence, this is an issue, I think. I don't know. Thank you very much. Okay, um, how about you respond to those two questions, Yusuf, and then hopefully I'll see lots more X's. Uh, otherwise, I'll start asking loads of questions. All sure. Right. Okay, thanks. No, those are very important questions. Let's start when is it right to use emergency le legislation and when does emergency legislation end? I think it's a very difficult one. It's a tricky one, right? Partly because you, at one level, understand the need for it, right? From a, because you've got to make choices that are hard and that are imposed, right? But on the other hand, this is the trick of policy and about emergency. People don't behave in ways that you expect if you keep saying this is emergency law all the time, right? UK is a very classic example right now, the whole debate between central government and Manchester, for example, where central government had to vote 
emergency legislation to ensure that Manchester fell into line. Um, I, we do explore that in the paper. We argue that in the long term, you see, while emergency legislation was used to make the choices, right, and we understand the need for making those choices, at the same time, what happened is you had almost uh, government uh, by default by philosopher kings, you know, male experts in advisory panels primarily making choices. In other words, unelected scientific advisors making hard choices who then uh, take on them, take upon themselves the right to make policy as well. And it's that kind of tension we point out. We don't come out clearly in, our, in the paper. It's a tension we rather signal and explore. The uh, other one who pays, it's obvious, government ends up paying for this, these ed tech solutions, right? The cost to government's high. For example, Track and Trace in UK is a large contract to a private company in the UK. The same in South Africa as well a lot of the contracts go to private companies who then step in to fulfill the void, whether that's in terms of delivery of services, delivery of, you know, protective equipment, delivery of uh, computer infrastructure. In other words, this is government resources, which brings me to a third point, which is in our paper, which we, we didn't talk about. In a sense, the one of the interesting things about the pandemic we observe in the various papers we write, it's the first time that a lot of uh, neoliberal economics were upturned right at the very start. Nobody thought twice about massive employment subsidies for jobs, right? Uh, there's a problem with it, but you, uh, it up, un, upended at its beginning upended neoliberal restrictive economic dogmas. Yet as we return to the new normal, you see that returning back again to what it was before. So clearly somewhere in the pandemic, quantitative easing, uh, breaking the idea that you have to have a certain deficit ratio relative to GDP, governments begin to rethink all of that. I mean, where else would you see uh, ministers of finance and chancellors of exchequer starting and saying it's okay to pump lots more money into the economy, into employment, into protection mechanism. But as things then change over time, the neoliberal economics start coming back into picture. So there was the possibility of a possible progressive agenda that could have emerged, even from the very neoliberals that were in charge in some countries, I guess. So, yeah. Uh, excellent. Okay. Um, okay, so I've got two more people, uh, Denise uh, Langbridge, Melion, and then Sarbani Chakraborty. Uh, Denise, do you wanna go first? Yes, please. Uh, thanks, Yusuf. Um, in our group, we talked about how this could be used as a moment of opportunity in terms of strengthening the agency of teachers and the role of unions uh, um, as opposed to the role of the university or whether we both have a role and how you see Yusuf that this could be a moment of positive change in terms of teacher training and um, maybe rethinking the curriculum. Okay, and uh, Sarbani? Hello. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know, Professor Say, if uh, you mentioned that um, the middle classes, uh, middle classes have kind of benefited from these uh, individualized um, learning. Can you just elaborate a bit? I mean, are we moving towards some kind of homeschooling? And if so, then are we assuming that there will be kind of um, you know, a labor participation rate of the parents and especially the mother would be lower. I, 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 otherwise, how, how can we um, kind of assume that middle classes and upper middle classes would benefit from this individualized home-based schooling? Okay, so there are two questions you're asking uh, and I'll start with the latter one, Mario. Is that okay? So one is, I'm gonna quote the Heritage Foundation in the US. 
The Heritage Foundation in the US said the COVID pandemic has accidentally and positively made homeschooling a viable option for everybody, which we've been advocating for a long time. In other words, it allows you to, to undermine the idea of a public education system and the idea of education as a public good. And in fact, we argue that's what you need to be protected because what homeschooling does, it potentially not only has class consequences in that middle class parents provide the necessary capital and resources and support for their learners. That's obviously one dimension of what you say, Sabani. But the other more important dimension is that it denudes or undermines the idea of a public education system. And the idea that schooling or education generally is a public space in which the so sociality of learning and the interaction between class, race, gender, et cetera, is as important as the content of learning. In fact, in our longer report we're working on now, we say what got lost in this entire narrow construction of curriculum as content is the idea of the sociality of learning and education as a social space, which allows for the bonds of commonality, solidarity and solidaristic thinking to emerge if we can protect that as a public space. So clearly we need to think about it uh, in that way. Thirdly, Sir Barney, I think your question is slightly different, is that would you see homeschooling as uh, having a gendered impact? We do say gender violence has gone up as well, but also middle class, you took him middle class females and labor participation. In fact, the, what we haven't reset, but we've noted as a trend, one of the biggest growing trends in South Africa has been private tutoring. Private tutoring has emerged as an important industry as a supplement to homeschooling. So the middle class can buy private tutors who can now operate online. If you just scan the Google, just Google home tutoring private, you'll notice the number of companies that are offering support for home learning now. So I think that's another dynamic. So in other words, they can buy themselves out. I think Denise's question, you can think about it. Rosa Luxemburg said that in any interregnum or moment of crisis, you stand between two choices a moment of reaction and default back to the normal that you had before, or you have the possibility and opportunity of a moment of transformation. And in a sense, part of what you need is active, assertive, agential social movements and citizens who see the moment as a possibility for creating an alternative social and policy imaginary for education which rethinks not only just education dogmas, but the kinds and purposes of that uh, of education. This should be a moment where we rethink fundamentally the purposes and values of education. Because if, for example, we quite comfortably can accept school uh, teacher-based assessment for high stakes progression now, why haven't we done it all along? Why is it only now? Why can't we go forward with the idea that school-based and teacher-based assessment is a valid way of assessment compared to externally-based assessment. If we can accept now that curriculum can be trimmed, you know, for whatever reason, for due to emergency, why can't we go forward and think of it later? If we can accept now that people who are forced out of work through no consequence of their own have the right to a social subsidy by the state, then why can't in future we accept that that's a right of any vulnerable worker who loses their job? Can you see that the, the moment allows us and how this crisis then pulls back to a different normal is a matter of political contestation, ideological contestation, and it's gonna be resolved by the struggle between contending forces on the ground in reality. And I think that's where expertise becomes important because there are different kinds of knowledge expertise that can be mobilized. Uh, okay. Um, uh, more questions? Uh, does anybody 
want to ask any other questions? Uh, Ankit Saraf, uh, over to you. Sam Wilson, after that. Yeah, uh, hi, thank you. Uh, this is Ankit. Uh, so my question was, uh, so in the Indian context, uh, I am from India. Uh, in the Indian context, what we're seeing is that uh, the pandemic has been declared as equivalent to a natural disaster and teachers can, as per constitution, be deputed for pandemic related duties. Um, so what has happened in India is that public school teachers have been deputed on all kinds of jobs, uh, such as uh, manning and coordinating quarantine and isolation centers, ration distribution, managing uh, migrant laborers, contact tracing, uh, etc. So oh, my question is in the larger uh, domain of what uh, some of what Yusuf also said that uh, professional development opportunities for teachers are not available. But also, uh, uh, apart from learning uh, the new technologies, teachers also do not have the space and time and also the mental space. Uh, uh, nobody's talking about social emotional learning and uh, psychosocial well-being of teachers. Leave that. Teachers also have to take online classes uh, and they do not have any idea how to do uh, such things. So my larger question is that uh, how do we see uh, the impact of the pandemic and the subsequent policies on the uh, professional identity of teachers in the long run, uh, especially in the developing countries context. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ankit. Uh, Sam? Thanks very much for your for your talk, um, Professor Syed. Um, I just had a question. Could you say a bit more about how education would interact with uh, environmental challenges that you referenced in the, um, in, in the early part of your talk? Thank you. Okay, Yusuf, over to you. Okay, thank you for those two questions. I mean, I clearly, I think those are important questions. I mean, we don't talk about in our work professional identities, but you're right. How the pandemic affect professional identities is important. You also reminded me, and I think, Ankit, you know it better than I do, that the new national education policy in India does talk about the way in which educate education in India has expanded what teachers are expected to do, but we need to also focus in on what they can do in a human way. They're not super agents, they're not, they can't do everything and anything. And I think that's part of it, you know, they can't be elect election mo monitors, run school feeding schemes, um, deal with the pandemic, provide health facilities, et cetera. And there should be a realistic appraisal of it. And I think that's really important because not only is it too much for them to do, as you're pointing out, it's also they have a particular skill sets and, uh, and also impacted by it. I think that's really important. But you also reminded me something about um, education, which I didn't speak about, is that the pandemic also operates on stereotypes and demonization of particular groups, right? Like any other crises, and in the paper we reference how, for example, you know, the Middle Ages, the plague, uh, reference particular groups who were responsible for it. And I'm, if you know, in India, how Islamophobia was stoked by the pandemic, you know, the whole hashtag Corona Jihad, the idea that the pandemic was spread by Muslims congregating in religious spaces or the idea that migrants carry the pandemic across borders, etc. It Pandemics also and crisis also results in greater stereotyping and demonizations of the most vulnerable. And I think part of a a teachers and part of teachers roles must be to tackle and deal with the kinds of uh, stereotypes and uh, misrepresentations that came into. Yes, I think you're right. I mean, Sam, that's an important part. The point we were making about the environment is that the pandemic's not just a health crisis, it's an environmental crisis. It's about the interaction with humans and the awareness of how we've dealt with environmental issues. The fact that we can't get consensus around climate change, for example. The fact that it's not even sufficiently embedded within current education and schooling curriculum. So we're saying that going forward uh, in one of our papers, we talk about the idea of resilient education system and prepared education systems, educations that are prepared for shocks, for crises, because economists talk about shocks and clearly this is a shock. 
but why is it such a shock? We've been known about this crisis for a long time, you know, as the quotes we have in our paper. I mean, we, we, we knew the consequences of the way we've dealt with the environment for many years now. The evidence, it's not like the evidence hasn't been there. So clearly how we build that into the system is, is as important. Okay. Um, thanks, thanks, Yusuf. Um, can, I, can I maybe um, ask a question? Um, Meredith, also Meredith, then you. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Where is Meredith? Oh, yes, Meredith. Uh, pass you on, Meredith. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so I was wondering about the impact of the slowdown of globalization. Some people say that it's kind of it's slowing down because governments are focusing more on domestic politics now due to the crisis. Um, and I was just wondering um, about the interrelation between that or the impact of that on public or private provision of education in the global south. Mari, your question maybe? Oh, okay. Um, uh, so um, my question, uh, Yusuf, is around um, the contradictions of trade unionism. You, you used a lot of quotes uh, from trade unionists and um, particularly public service trade union unionists as teachers, uh, as teachers are. On the one hand, the trade union is responsible for the protection of its members. And on the other hand, um, as a public, ser as, as a civil servant, uh, uh, teachers are also, in a sense, responsible for the reproduction of the public education system. No? And I'm wondering about the tensions and contradictions of that, because it seems to me that a lot of teachers unions around the world um, have been strongly advocating for a kind of health first policy which often leads to a strong position on lockdown and the closure of schools. But we know the long term effects of the closure of schools on the most marginalized communities. So how is that contradiction manifesting itself in different parts of the world? You know, what are the issues that are coming out uh, um, in terms of unions positions uh, on the kind of health economy binaries and in terms of short term, long term uh, effects on inequalities and that challenge between protection of members versus the public good uh, of the system as a whole. Thank you, Mario. That's a very difficult but important question, you know, because in the hat and in, in the end, every professional group, whether it's teachers or pediatric associations or academics, at one level are self-interested groups. You know, they advocate for their self-interest. And the point about the pandemic is not only is it a national public good, it also has a global public dimension to it. And so how do you hold on to the idea of a, of a global public and a national public? I'm partly also answering Meredith's question. And you're right, the issue of the unions has been in South Africa, the debate in South Africa has been around that some unions have been arguing for closures to the detriment, uh, uh, arguably of learners who are more marginalized, for whom home learn learning is not even a possibility. It's not even a distinct possibility, you know. Uh, in fact, for some would argue that schools are safe places for some from marginalized, disadvantaged uh, learners as well. So that's the one. But then there are also other unions who have been advocating for opening of schools. I guess for me, the I don't have an answer, but the issue would be to work out the conditions under which you reopen schools. Secondly, I think the point you're making about uh, unions and teachers is also which union and which teacher gets represented. And it's a particular subset and group that gets represented in South Africa in particular. So South Africa, for example, have about eight teacher unions. And clearly there are some that are more dominant than others and they get a larger voice in it. So I don't have an answer, but I think you're right. Uh, the tension that the pandemic brings out in education is how do you maintain the idea of a uh, have a common good and a public ideal against self-interest of different groups, 
whether they are self-interest groups of teacher unions or even certain civil society factions, as I call them, because even social movements don't all speak with the same voice. They all have diverse views, for example, you know. So the COVID-19 Alliance for me represents a particular constituency of social movements in South Africa, speaking with a particular voice on certain matters. The thing about Meredith's question is interesting because in the paper, Meredith, uh, the second one, we do talk about uh, COVID uh, bringing what we call at one level chauvinistic and ethno-nationalism on the one hand. There's almost a nationalism. And in a sense, one could argue that COVID has brought to the fore the idea of the nation state once again. But that would only be part of the story, Marida, because in a sense, globalization doesn't stop. For example, think of vaccines and who controls the production, manufacture, distribution and control of vaccines in a global context. It's often outside the hands of nation states to an extent. So it's not like globalization has stopped. And I don't think that's accurate at all. Globalizations have, may have taken a different form. It's not that it's just stopped. So I think you need to, again, it's one of those contradictions. You see the resurgence of nation states and nationalism and what we call ethno and chauvinistic nationalism on the one hand, but you also see assertions of global, certain particular forms of globalizations and global understanding. So I don't think it's one or the other. It's a little bit more nuanced. And I think part of the criticism we faced in our writings is we don't, we don't come up clearly one way or the other on some of these issues because they are complex at one level. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Well, uh, I think we're just about there at quarter past, uh, quarter past two. So I'd like to close the lecture. Um, firstly, by uh, thanking uh, Yusuf uh, for a very stimulating presentation and uh, to all of you for a very uh, uh, interesting question uh, and answer session. Um, I've got two more announcements. Um, the first one is that next week's, uh, next week's lecture um, is from uh, Dr. Nimi Hoffman uh, from the University of Sussex. Um, and the title of this is The Construction and Survival of an Intellectual Community During Structural Adjustment in Africa. And Nimi will be uh, reflecting through the kind of uh, the glasses of the current COVID pandemic around how academics coped with the last round of massive austerity in the 1980s uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and how they managed to uh, construct academic communities. So I, I think that that's going to be a really fantastic um, uh, presentation and discussion. Um, I should also secondly add that um, our 10 week lecture series has now become an 11 week lecture series with the addition of week 11. Um, Professor Steve Cleese, who many of you know um, from the University of Maryland, um, has kindly uh, offered to give a, uh, a presentation on the political economy of education in perilous times, some reflections. That will be on Thursday, 17th of December. So we're, we're extending one week. It's the day before my children break up from school, so it's no problem for me. Maybe some of you have an extended vacation period and you might not be able to make it, but they'll all be online and recorded anyway. Um, thanks, Steve, very much. Uh, for offering to, to give that lecture. Um, again, thank you very much. I apologize if anybody had problems getting on to Zoom today. Uh, I have no idea why um, there was some issues with this. Um, it's the same link every week. Please share it, uh, the more the merrier. And uh, if for some reason you do get disrupted and can't log in, they're always available on our YouTube channel and uh, get edited out, uh, edited uh, as we go along. So again, thank you very much. Thanks to Yusuf for a great lecture and thank you all for attending this and see you next week. Thank you everybody and I enjoy the session and thank you for your very stimulating thoughts and questions.